Uh, please be reminded, we'll be singing all three stanzas of the national anthem and then the chorus. Stand and sing of Zambia, proud and free, land of work and joy in unity. Victors in the struggle for the right, we've won. Freedom's fight, all one, strong and free. Africa is our own motherland, fashioned with and blessed by God's good hand. Let us all her people join as one, brothers under the sun all one strong and free one land and one nation is our cry dignity and peace neath zambia's sky like our noble eagle in its flight Zambia, praise to Thee, all one, strong and free, praise be to God, bless our great nation, free men we stand, under the flag of our land, Zambia, praise to Thee, all one, strong and free. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. To our guests of honor, the Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry, Ms. Kayula Siame. The Chief Executive Officer at Superior Milling, Mr. Peter Cotton. Senior Government Officials present, Mr. Imanga Wamunima Jr., representing Food Lovers Market. Of course, our most distinguished invited guests and those who are helping the wheels of agriculture turn within the country. Colleagues and comrades from the press, may I simply say ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the official launch of the Agribusiness Bootcamp. This is an exciting venture that will surely set us into the future within stride with all the technological advancements that are being made to ensure that our agricultural sector catapults itself into its rightful place as a major driver of this economy, not only for Zambia, but the entire continent. But ladies and gentlemen, before I go off and become too preemptive and say everything that subsequent speakers will need to say, it is my delight to call upon Mr. Lukonga Linduda to give his opening remarks. And this is the executive director at Bongo Hive. A warm round of applause for him. Good morning. Um, let me just uh, recognize the high table, uh, the PS, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Kayula Siame uh, from the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry and also Gloria Piri, who's a project manager at ZATP, uh, Food Lovers representative Imanga Wamunima, and also Peter Kotan, who's a, a MD at Supreme Milling. So a couple of things that we're going to talk about um, so we all understand where we are. So the opportunity that we're presenting today and we were launching uh, is an um, agribusiness bootcamp. Uh, but more specifically, we're looking at agri-processing. So if you are adding value, and it's something that we keep talking about, you know, are we adding value uh, to what we are producing? We want to encourage people who are adding value. 
We want to support them in a way that they can connect, learn, and grow. And this uh, will happen over the next few months. Um, the idea is that when we open, and we have actually already opened for applications, when you apply via the website, we're targeting three provinces, uh, Eastern Province, Lusaka, and also um, the Copper Belt Province. So we have three places where we will actually be able to work with entrepreneurs. So once people apply, we shortlist uh, 50 entrepreneurs or SMEs in each province, um, and we'll then do that um, speed dating component, which is stage two where over two days we'll be able to work with five judges who are from different disciplines in the agribusiness value chain. And the idea is that apart from you submitting an application uh, online that we can meet with these entrepreneurs so they can pitch, uh, we also be able to teach you how to pitch. So apart from, you know, uh, these online processes, we will also be able to build your capacity even before you actually, if you manage to get into the, the boot camp itself. So beyond stage two, we will only pick up 30 entrepreneurs. So already from 150 people that we'll work with over those two days of speed dating, we only want 30 entrepreneurs or 30 SMEs. Um, and those 30 SMEs uh, we will then bring to Lusaka for a five-day boot camp, and that's the third stage. And in that five-day boot camp, we have various experts that will be able to really work with you on your business. Now, one of the big things that we're looking for, in fact, if not the most important, is growth. Are you a growth entrepreneur? Are you looking to grow, or you're just doing something to feed you and your family over the next few days? So the entrepreneurs that we are looking for are those that are looking to grow, those that have ambition. And in those five days, those are the five days that we've set aside. Um, and you know, we, we, we are, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the World Bank and our partners, we're putting in so much resource for you to have access to the right networks, the right um, um, uh, experts in the industry, Industry because we know it's more than just money. Business is not just about getting a bit of money. The opportunity that will present uh, a good example for, uh, is uh, Peter Cotton, who uh, will be one of the mentors, for example. Lots of uh, experience in the industry. If you spend one hour with him or two hours, there's so much that you can gain, uh, so much you can gain from that process. Right, and at the end, uh, we have a pitch um, I would rather not say it's a competition. It's rather just a process for us to get to the last 10 entrepreneurs or 10 SMEs that we'll be able to work with over six, uh, six weeks. And this uh, will involve a process of mentorship. Um, one of the challenges in the industry, of course, is just linkages. How can we connect to the right type of people? And also right institutions. So we have commitment, for example, from food lovers. Uh, if you have a great product, um, um, food lovers are willing to work with you over those six weeks to ensure that your, pr your product actually gets into their store. Um, and so I just uh, uh, f uh, sort of summarized what happens in the boot camp, but these are more specifics about uh, what we'll cover in each, each day. So definitely we'll work with you on exploring growth opportunities, financial tools, regulations and standards. So we'll have people like Zambia um, uh, Bureau of Standards coming in to talk about standards and all those. So lots of partners that we are getting on board to be able to provide the right type of content for you. Now, let's just make it very, very clear, okay, what is the criteria? Um, what we are looking for, definitely you must be registered with PACRA um, and you must be in agro-processing. So, um, if you are just a farmer, um, this may not be for you, uh, but if you are adding value to what you are actually uh, planting and, 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 and reaping, then this is for you. So not, not less than one year in operation and not more than 10 years um, in existence. I've talked about growth-oriented entrepreneurship and one last thing which is very important that you are also generating 
uh, revenue. So we're just looking at 150,000 kwacha in annual sales, uh, which probably comes down to around 12,000 kwacha a month, I, I believe, 10, 12. 12,000 kwacha a month. So if you're able to make, if you're already making that much money every month uh, or 150,000 a year, this is an opportunity for you. Now, um, the application form is live. Some of you may have already applied. Um, Agribootcamp.co.zm um, is the website which has all the information. I must state also that right now we are live uh, on Facebook. So if you go to our page, Agribusiness Bootcamp uh, ZM, uh, we are running this whole session live on Facebook. Um, also, we are on Twitter, Agribootcamp uh, ZM. And these are my only remarks for, for the day. I'll come back later to uh, moderate the panel. Thank you. Thank you so very much for those concise opening remarks that have given us an insight into why we are all here. We're now going to hear from the Zambia Agribusiness and Trade Project, and representing them is none other than the project manager there, and this is Ms. Gloria Peary. Please welcome her to the lectern. Uh, we are allowed to give her a warm round of applause. Thank you, and good morning. Oh my God, it's so, I don't know if people are not excited, I, know, I don't know why. Is it because it's very early in the morning, people are still waking up? If it was in church, I would say somebody say hallelujah or something. <laughs> okay, so senior government officials present, representatives of the World Bank, representatives of InfoDave, various captains of industry, and of course our stars today, the entrepreneurs who have joined us and are potential participants of the agribusiness. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am pleased that you could join us today and thank you for accepting the invitation to participate in the bootcamp and to participate in the launch. I'd just like to say a few words just to give context to why we are here and to just share a few pointers on what the agribusiness and trade project is about. So the Agribusiness and Trade Project is a collaboration of the World Bank and the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry. The project was launched on 4th, 4th October 2017 and will be implemented over a five-year period. Our objective is to contribute to increased market linkages and firm growth in agribusiness and trade. In this regard, the project has three components as areas of support. We have market linkages in agribusiness, which is our component one, strengthening the institution and regulatory framework for agribusiness and trade, and project management, monitoring, and evaluation. Under component one, under which this bootcamp is anchored, the project will work with two sets of beneficiaries, and these are poor and emerging farmers and agribusiness SMEs. The aim of this component is to improve the ability of smallholder farmers, SMEs, to commercially and sustainably link into markets. This will be achieved using two approaches. Our work, through our work with farmers, we are going to work with uh, using an instrument that we are calling Building Productive Alliances. This intervention will facilitate investments in technical and financial capacities of farmers in order to boost their productivity and improve the quality and quantity of their products. Under the same component, we also have the Supplier Development Program, which specifically focuses on SMEs. The aim of this intervention is to promote the growth of SMEs and enable them transform into stable and consistent suppliers of products in different end markets, which is the business of the day to day. In both approaches, the goal is to move our target clients from their current levels of productivity to higher levels through technical and financial support. Under component two, the project will work, will support the strengthening of the regulatory and institutional framework that will facilitate the smooth conduct of agribusiness and trade and create market linkages within the country and across borders. Two strategies will be used to achieve this objective. The first strategy will focus on strengthening the capacity of the business regulation. Under this strategy, the project will support institutions such as the Business Review and Regulatory Agency, 
the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, and the Zambia Bureau of Standards. The second strategy under this component is promoting trade facilitation. This intervention seeks to contribute towards addressing the gap that currently exists due to the country's lack of logistic strategy and its resulting impact on trade in general and agribusiness in particular. The agribusiness boot camp is therefore an important milestone for the project. As we begin to prepare for the actual implementation, on the ground implementation and our work with SMEs, the boot camp also demonstrates a number of similar interventions and initiatives that the project will be implementing in order to provide practical support to the beneficiaries. And so ladies and gentlemen, without further much Ado, I would like to introduce our guest of honor, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry, to make the official declaration for this event. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a round of applause for our distinguished guest of honor, the Permanent Secretary, Mrs. Kayula Siame. Thank you, uh, Gloria. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> I think you have now been inspired by um, the welcoming remarks from um, Mrs. Ms. Banda. It really gives me great pleasure this morning to be with you here today and um, to, to see one of our great milestones being achieved in regard to the Zambia Cultural and Trade Project. Senior governments who are, who are present here today, members of the World Bank, representatives, InfoDev group, as well as the private sector, and of course our entrepreneurs. It really is, you are really, really most welcome to be with us here today. And I know you are not really here to hear speeches, but I think it's something that I would like you just to pay a bit of attention, because I know you are very, very excited and you want to get to the real thing, and you really want to go and do what you do best. As you know, the Minister of Commerce, Trade and Industry is implementing the Zambia Agribusiness and, Trade, Agribusiness and Trade Project. And through this project, one of the key components of this project is to support the small and medium en enterprise businesses, and in particular, the agribusiness uh, businesses. And in view of that, today marks a very, very special day as we will be embarking on launching the first ever SME Agribusiness Boot Camp in Zambia. Allow me at this time to thank most sincerely uh, the World Bank Group, in particular InfoDev and uh, Bongo Hive, for, for formulating and also for designing this boot camp that you will all be undertaking in the next uh, few weeks. As you know, the government is very, very aware that the SMEs play a very significant role in, the, in contributing to our economic growth in Zambia. In particular, the SMEs are really a tool for empowerment and also for ensuring that they bring a lot of innovations and support the employment creation agenda which the government has to this country. My ministry has a vision to create an enabling environment for the SMEs to grow and then to thrive and also to ensure that their, their, their businesses are also sustainable. Nonetheless, I think we also know that there are a lot of challenges that most of you entrepreneurs face. Some of them, which you have already mentioned on a number of occasions, relate to access to credit, access to business development services, access to, to services that help you grow, access even to technology, and also the limited markets that are available for you. So we are aware of all these challenges. And this boot camp, at least once it's implemented and the outputs and the outcome of this boot camp, we are confident will meet most, if not all, of those challenges that I have mentioned. This initiative is part of the broader national policy of diversification, and it includes um, private sector participation, where government is focusing on, on creating an enabling environment for the private sector to efficiently and effectively participate in the socioeconomic development of our country. And here, as you know, emphasis is being put on local production, local promotion of our domestic products, making them ready for
for the domestic market, but also making them ready for the regional and the international market. So both of these are going together. And in making them ready, we also have to make sure that um, they, also, they also have an environment that is competitive, where the consumers are also protected. So you can see this is the balance that we are looking for for the SMEs. And in the context of our seventh national development plan, the project directly supports the achievement of Pillar 1 by assisting agribusiness to diversify and add value to production and also expand the market access for Zambian products and services and also improve trade facilitation so that trading activities can take place in an efficient, transparent and predictable manner. And this, of course, requires issues of quality, it requires issues of packaging, technical support, trade remedy support, and also ensuring that the industries are well grounded and are able to be most competitive. As has already been mentioned by the project manager, the project, the ZATA project, the Zambia Agribusiness and Trade Project, aims to boost, to boost growth, which is, which is the agribusiness oriented SMEs. And I think that point was emphasized. What we are really looking at is agribusiness. So we're looking at those businesses that are adding value. We know that we have farmers who produce, and I think we have different products for that. But for this intervention, we're looking at those that have added value or are adding value. And I think the criteria was already uh, pointed out by uh, the representative from Bonga Hive. And we believe that um, this will be achieved through the implementation of the Market Connect, an advisory brokerage and financial support services that aims to promote the sustainable integration of agribusiness SMEs into value chains with established end markets and large buyers by strengthening the ability of SMEs to invest in productivity, enhancing know-how, and meet buyer requirements. Because we know that this has always been a problem. Once you add the value, then what? Where do you take your products? Where do you sell your products? How do you know that your products are of high quality? How do you know that your products will be accepted? So this is, these are some of the needs, these are some of the questions that we're hoping will be answered through this intervention. So the focus will be on helping these SMEs improve their commercial viability. I mean, in the ultimate aim is to ensure that you become a more commercial viable entity. And as already been mentioned, the criteria being used is people who are already in business means you've already started something, you've already taken that risk. So now we're just adding and helping you move to the next level. Because I think one of the key things we want to see is our SMEs moving to the next level. We don't want you to remain where you are for the next five, ten years. We want to see that growth. So they'll be looking at what is the growth potential. So it's up to you as SMEs to show your potential, to show that you have the potential to grow. And through these interventions, these will just support and facilitate that growth. Because you have already started something. So we are just supporting you in that regard. So my ministry is therefore pleased to launch the SME Agribusiness Bootcamp. It is expected through this bootcamp that a selection of the agripreneurs, as we're calling them, that's what you'll be called, your agripreneurs, <laughs> will be identified and monitored, and you become the first beneficiaries of our Market Connect service. This launch will also kick off the implementation of the other activities for the project. So I wish to encourage you SMEs who are here today, those who haven't done it yet, to submit your applications. I'm sure many of you or most of you have already submitted, so you're really eager. But, the, but for those of you who are not sure, wondering what is this SME boot camp ab about, you know, what benefit will I have? I hope that at the end of today, you'll be fully, fully convinced and you'll also be able to submit uh, for the boot camp. I know as you know, as you have heard, it will be a very, very competitive process. But I think um, competitiveness is good for us because in being competitive, it means we are attaining the highest quality in terms of not only the businesses, but even our products and our services. And I think that is very, very good for Zambia. So I want to, into, I want to also to encourage the larger firms that are already established that will be mentoring to coach these so that they can learn from your vast experience. We know from, from companies such as, from individuals such as Mr. Cotton, he has a lot of experience. So as you'll be participating, make sure you learn a lot from, this will be your opportunity to sit with somebody who has been in the business for a long time and who can assist you and help you and mentor you. 
And we know that um, through this process, we will be able to bring on more on board who will be able to mentor you. So really, I would like to encourage you all SMEs who are here today, that as a ministry, and we are very, very, very excited about this boot camp, because it's the first ever, and we know that looking ahead, this will really, really spur a lot of development for entrepreneurs here in Zambia, not only for supporting them in terms of just access to finance, but much, much more. I think being a commercial uh, viable entity is more than just finance. There is a lot that you need to know about, and we, we believe that through this uh, intervention, this will be made available to you. So with these few remarks, it is now my honor and my privilege to now declare the SME Boot Camp for Agribusiness officially launched. Thank you. Thank you so very much to Madam Siame for that inspiring official launch. We are now officially airborne and we're off to the business end of this launch. And we will call upon a representative of an organization that prides itself in forcing the quality and the standard of produce to go up because their ethos is simply, we will pay top kwacha if you provide us with top quality product. And this is a game changer in the local produce industry. And this is none other than Two Brothers Food Lovers Market. And representing them and giving everybody here a little teaser with regards to what is possible in the market is their representative, Mr. Imanga Wamunyima Jr. Good morning, everybody. Okay, uh, my name is, uh, if you have heard, uh, Mango Amnima Jr. I'm representing Two Brothers Food Lovers Market. I'm the branch manager for Food Lovers Market, uh, McKinney branch. Um, it is a great honor to be part of uh, such uh, an event, considering the fact that it is an event that brings together uh, various people who are innovative and want to make a difference in the economy. Um, thank you very much for being keen on such an event. I'll just go straight into the, the main points. Uh, as food lovers, we pride not into giving long speeches. Um, and it's good that all the speeches here today have been short and good to the point. And uh, as the permanent secretary has said, everybody else is excited uh, with um, the launch of this boot camp because it's going to you know, bring in value addition and we'll see SMEs participating on the market and we'll be able to you know, have a standing and reducing the, you know, the, the imports that are you know, dominating the market currently. Just to uh, say briefly about Food Lovers Market Two Brothers. Food Lovers Market Two Brothers uh, came into existence in 2014 with the flagship store at East Park Mall. And um, I'm representing the manager who's supposed to be here, Mr. Henry Jerry, who's a manager for East Park Mall. And uh, Food Lovers Market has, is currently um, uh, the master holders of the Food Lovers brand in Zambia. So which means that uh, all Food Lovers stores that are set to open are all under the Two Brothers Market uh, uh, food Lovers Market. Why would it be called Two Brothers? Food Lovers Market Two Brothers is owned by two wonderful brothers called the Patel Brothers, Samir and Ishan Patel. And uh, they are passionate about uh, supporting local producers. And this is a deliberate company policy that we have. And in our existence, for the last three years, we've opened three stores, which is Food Lovers Market uh, East Park Mall, Food Lovers Market McKinney, Food Lovers Market Garden City, just there by the airport roundabout. And uh, currently, as Food Lovers Market, 98% um, of our vegetables are locally produced, and we source directly from the local farmer. Um, the only time that we import vegetables is when there is a shortfall in the market because of season. 
eat, etc. But 98% of, of our vegetables are delivered at our back doors at every food lover's market store. We do not have a middleman who procures, food lover, or who procures fresh produce on our behalf or any other product. We deal directly with the producer and we negotiate the price based on the existing marketing for market forces. Therefore, um, you find that we're competitive when it comes to pricing because there is no markup added by middleman or cartel that is managing our procurement process. Our doors are open. We engage farmers, producers, SMEs every day of our lives just to get to have a relationship, a direct relationship with them. And currently, our three stores are supporting over 500 local producers. And um, the McKinney store on its own has over 200 farmers based in Lusaka delivering to its back door every day uh, based on the order schedules. And uh, when it comes to the fruits, I think for the fruits, that's where the challenge is. 80% of it is the export. Uh, the 20% is the local pineapples, the local mangoes that we can get, and the local bananas. And um, I think this is where, in going forward, is the opportunity. Because I think if well, the climate, of course, is a savanna type of climate, but I think there is an opportunity to expand on uh, f you know fruits being grown into the country beyond bananas, apples, avocados, and also, but in a nutshell, I'd simply say that so far so good with the um, SMEs that we're dealing with, and we are keen to increase um, the number of SMEs or agribusinesses, agri entrepreneurs, as it has been correctly said, that we want to deal with because. The opportunity in the market is vast. Uh, currently, all our 500, over 500 farmers are not meeting uh, the demand, you know, in terms of produce because people are beginning to appreciate um, the value of uh, locally grown uh, fresh produce. Uh, we also have a strong, uh, a strong feeling when it comes to the hygiene, and all the processes in the value chain when it comes to the quality of the product. We are involved with the producers in ensuring that uh, this quality, uh, the quality of the produce that they supply um, is consumable and meets the required standards. Um, we do take farm visits as often as we can, or business visits, we visit these businesses engage them on um, how best we can help them as players in the market. Uh, when it comes to their packaging, we do recommend uh, companies that are producing this packaging and so forth. Uh, and, um, our procedure for an SME or for any uh, farmer or agribusiness to register with us is simple and straightforward. If you are trading as a business name, we do register those that are trading as a business name. Those who are tra trading as um, individuals, sole traders, we do register those as well. We have deliberately done this in order to avoid the bureaucracy in getting the, pro the Zambian product on the shelf. And in as far as uh, the producer meets the required uh, legal requirements. If they're a sole trader, and it doesn't matter to us, as long as we register them, tell them what we want, negotiate the price, then we, 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 we go for it. Companies as well, those that are trading as farmers, um, the, the opportunity, I think, with food lovers is, is vast. And I'm here to tell you that um, to answer the question to say where is the market. We are the market. We are one of those that are extending the olive branch to say we are the market. We want those products, Zambian products on the shelf. Sometimes when um, I think of saying we have a bumper harvest of maize and we still cannot produce our local conflicts in the country, it is something that hurts me because how possible is it that we are harvesting so much maize and still importing conflicts. We need players that can establish industry, that can establish, add value to the maze, 
let us have that participation so that, you know, even the soya beans that we are harvesting, we must have that oil from the soya beans coming from Zambia. And this is what we're encouraging our, our, all those that we're dealing with, that our priority is to ensure that, you know, we provide that market. And through this market, we know that there is enough local benefit in terms of employment, taxes, and revenue going to the government. And um, I'm here to also say that we are excited about this boot camp because it is the necessary first step required to encourage that participation of value addition. And as Food Lovers Market Two Brothers, we're here to say we will continue to partner with the relevant uh, organizations in ensuring that all the efforts to grow the agribusiness in Zambia come to fruit. This is my presentation to you. This thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wamnima. Uh, I think the gauntlet has been thrown down, and the challenge needs to be taken up by our agripreneurs. If there is one takeaway from the boot camp, it will be a change of mindset to look at the possibilities that exist beyond the norm. And he has spoken about great opportunities for various components of agriculture and the value chain addition process. I'm going to call upon a person who knows a little something about value addition, and you have probably heard him on various fora, um, with increasing PR and marketing efforts to ensure that he makes it very trendy for us to eat in Shima, as well as Vitumboa and all other products that emanate from the value addition that his organization has ventured into. To give us an industry talk, which will highlight not only the opportunities, but also the challenges and pitfalls of which there are, is a man who is no stranger to the agri business. And this is none other than the MD at Superior Milling, and a gentleman we have come to know as Mr. Superior Milling. Please welcome to the lectern, Mr. Peter Cotton. This is the new greeting, isn't it? <laughs> no handshakes. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Agribusiness entrepreneurs, it's very, very uh, uh, grateful. I'm very grateful to actually be in front of you here today because I think you're going to play a very important role in the future of agribusiness. And SMEs play a very, very important part, so it's good that you're all here today. Um, I'd just like to uh, welcome the, uh, my good friend, the Permanent Secretary um, to the Ministry of Commerce and Trade. Very great, grateful to have you here. You always support our very many events. Recently, the ZAM Week, where we particularly touched on value addition. So it's great to be following that up. And also to our World Bank representative, after last time seeing you when we had all those uh, uh, traders that come down from the Great Lakes region, and we're still working on that. It's nice to see you again, and uh, all the um, uh, um, all the all, all these sort of representatives and everyone of the boot camp. I think this is a marvelous, marvelous initiative. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, um, just give you a brief background. And uh, yes, I'm in front of the media uh, regularly. It's actually easier to talk in front of cameras than, and, and the radio than it is to you face to face. I must get used to it again, because I've been a lot on ZNBC and uh, Hot FM recently, and still we're still doing those shows, but it's good to see you. And uh, I've got, as uh, Kamiza said, a good friend of mine, uh, in-depth experience in agribusiness, so I do feel uh, confident that uh, I can help you through this boot camp. I've got 43 years of agribusiness uh, experience, can you imagine? And I'm actually a farmer. You think I'm a miller, but I know nothing about milling. <laughs> I'm not a miller. I'm a farmer by profession. You should know that. So 43 years basically of farming experience. I've had my own farms, my own uh, horticultural farm, my own floricultural farm, growing roses for export. I've uh, grown SME vegetables to supply food lovers and uh, spa and uh, many others, and not too long ago. And uh, I recently moved uh, into milling with National Milling and now with Superior Milling, uh, 15 years in the milling business. And I've spent uh, 30 years of my agribusiness experience here in Zambia. 
and see myself more as a Zambian now. So uh, thank you very much. So I really want to contribute to um, the development of agriculture policy. Government know that. I work very closely with them. Whoever's in power, I work with the government of the day to make sure we promote agricultural policy and look after food security. I think it's very, very important. So as I say, you play a very important role. So uh, if we could just start the presentation and go through the slides. Thank you very much. That just prompts me to make sure I don't spend too long talking to you. And to the next one. Just a quick brief about uh, superior milling. Uh, because I think you got, should understand where we're coming from and our role that we're playing. Uh, we're 20 years old, so we're one of the oldest milling companies in the country. So we've got a good depth. It is totally indigenous owned, 100%. No foreign shareholding at all. So very proud to finally be working for 100% owned indigenous uh, Zambian operated company. Um, with, as you know, our products, Milili, but I think the difference is what I've brought to uh, Superior Milling is the diversification. In other words, going into other trading products other than just Milli Mill. So really looking at true value addition. You know, we've launched uh, our own sugar, which is a trade partnership with Kifuri Sugar. We've got our own Mongo Rice which we're working uh, with all the Western province farmers. I'll talk more about that just now. Uh, we've got flour. We work at a partnership with a, a wheat mill. And uh, we've, we've got salt, as well as all the variable uh, maize mill products that we have through the chain. So we do very much follow the value addition uh, uh, system. So if we just go on to the next uh, slide. Thank you. OK, product and processing. What is? Agribusiness. It's actually a new terminology. We didn't even know the word agribusiness, but it's come forward because what it is, is it's farm to fork concept. It's taking it from production through processing to retail, and that's known in the trade as farm to fork. And uh, I've done a lot of uh, consultancy, I've done feasibility studies on this because, as I say, I have in depth with agriculture, vegetable production, um, livestock production. I'm even qualified under livestock production as well as milling. So it means that I can really help you of whatever you decide you want to go into, we can come up and look at ideas how to take it forward. But let's look at the challenges and the pitfalls basically as well as you know, just the, the good side of it because we've got to try and make sure that you're one of those 10 that get through to the end. Okay. So just going through to the next, next slide. What are the opportunities? Keep going. Thank you. Opportunities on value addition. There are, there are so many opportunities out there. I've just uh, got a few here. If we talk about uh, if, if you've got uh, access to land in Western province, you know, we've launched the Mongo Rice. And uh, it's really doing well. It's a partnership currently with only ShopRite. I'll talk about food lovers because uh, we work with food lovers as well, with a milli mill. But with the mongrel rice, we're actually going to expand it next year. I haven't even spoke to Mr. Kamango about that yet. And we're going to roll out our mongrel rice to all the supermarket chains in the country because it's been such a success this year. What does that do? It brings opportunities for those of you that can get into the value chain of either producing the rice or even be a middleman to buy the rice, mill it, small mills, we're talking about SMEs now, grading it and selling to a guaranteed market. Because to me, starting from the end, going backwards, the most important thing you must remember that I talk about today is that you need a trade partnership or a guaranteed market offtake for your product that you finally decide to, to embark upon. So that's what we've done. We're no different than an SME. In order for me to ensure that I can launch the Mongo Rice, I had to make sure that I had a guaranteed customer that would help me promote and sell that product so that when I go to the banks and get financing for it, they see I've already got a contract and they will support it. And then you just develop the market from there. So that's very, very important to, to take into account. Other opportunities uh, with government, we're working on diversification from maize milling and maize mill into cassava production. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture wants us to start 
uh, putting a certain percentage of cassava into bread and into maize meal, because quite a lot of you like cassava. Why should you mix it yourself? Us manufacturers should start mixing it and offering you a product. So cassava production is another thing to look at. Um, vegetables, of course, vegetables is probably the easiest thing for you to get into, but I've been a vegetable producer, and I know it is a problem, like a lot of businesses in, in this country, there's oversaturation of product. These guys will take advantage of you because they can go to so many different people and push the prices down. So you've got to be very wary that when you produce a product, and I'm talking from experience, make sure it's a product that is in demand and it's got a fairly stable price uh, factor throughout the season because, of course, a lot of vegetables are seasonal and you can make sure that you can cover your overhead and make yourself a good profit. I've been a big tomato grower and I've lost money growing tomatoes, I promise you. Why? Because you get that flood of Tanzania f tomatoes come in or the commercial farmers start growing them and you cannot even get 50 quacho a box. So, you know, it's, it's easy. I think a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake that they want to just grow something, they know how to do it. They don't look at the market first. It's very important to go and discuss with your off-taker what, pro what products is he missing, what products does he need, what products is he willing to take from you on a reasonable price. Uh, other things like livestock production, I think there's a great opportunity still for growing eggs for chickens, particularly broilers. Now we've, you know, we've still got the ban on uh, uh, bird flu, so it means that we're not saturated with cheap Brazilian imports of, of poultry meat. I think it's a great opportunity for still being an SME on, on growing chickens and the value addition on chickens. I say with pig production, I understand there's a shortage of pig meat in the country, and you can go into the production of pigs. These are all things that I'm passing on to you, which I know have a good demand. What this does as well, it brings opportunity for the stock feed industry. You know, yes, it means that you'll be at that much higher level, but certainly there are great opportunities for stock feed production in this country because the livestock production uh, is going up in this country because the demand is going up. Um, if you look on the baking side, SMEs for small bakeries. We're self-sufficient virtually on wheat production in this country, and uh, we've got a, 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 an overcapacity of wheat milling, but there is a great opportunity for the value additional side, all the confectionery and bakery side of producing products from flour. So definitely, I think some of you should definitely have the idea of putting out small bakeries, or if you currently got bakeries, I think there's a very good future on the baking side of uh, that side. So really and truly, you, and it was mentioned earlier that there are products like cornflakes and so many maize products. There's also honey being produced in this country. There's uh, peanut butter which is being produced. There's uh, tomato paste and all these sauces. There are a lot of opportunities out there for the value addition, but you've got to go to the market first. Okay, so so not too much on the too much more on the opportunities. Just carry on with the thing. So. Other opportunities well in the markets are cross-border trade. And uh, if you're anywhere located on any of our seven, eight boundaries, we see cross-border trade a very, very important part of marketing. Yes, we've had export bans, but it's government's current policy to keep the borders open as much as possible unless we have a food security issue. And at the moment, all the borders are open, and it's a great opportunity to see what the other country is short of. Zimbabwe is still very short of product. They get most of it from Zambia and South Africa. There's great opportunities there for validation. Or to get the product that you decide on eventually, look at that market. Because then Belessa, I've spent so many hours there. That is a marvelous market for anything you produce. There's value addition because they import everything into the DRC. Angola is another one, Western Province, Zimbabwe, these are real possible markets for you to access. So you need to do your market research, but you need to talk to some of us and look at what products can possibly be exported through cross-border trade. We're not talking about formal exports and tonnages, we're talking about small SMEs cross-border trading. Okay. What are the challenges? Ah, there's a lot of challenges. But we don't want to put you all off. Number one is finance. 
deeper you eat it, the bigger you are, the harder it is. I promise you. I promise you. You think it's hard for SMEs to access financing? No. The banks, they want us just to work for them. We have to give them the shirt off our back for collateral. I don't care if any bank is here. It's very, very difficult. My advice is don't borrow money to go into business. I promise you. If you think you can go to the bank and borrow 30% and you're going to make a profit out of business, then you must be producing diamonds or gemstones or something. Because most of the products we'll be talking about in agribusiness will probably not earn you more than 30 40% gross margin. And you're paying the bank 30% interest? It's a non-starter. You need trade partnerships. I'm giving away all the secrets now. You need equity partners. I promise you. You need to find a friend or a relative or a businessman that has a bit of cash. You can sell him the project profile, you know, the feasibility study, that this is a good investment to invest in you as an individual in your business and your ideas. And you can bring to that uh, proposal a trade agreement. That's the work you have to do. You have to go out and find the market. If you find the market first and take that to an investor, you've got a very good chance you will find an investor. And when we're talking about SMEs, we're not talking about so much money. You saw how you qualify here. You know? So to, to access SME money, and if you speak to Zambia National Farmers Union, uh, the, the ministries, I'm sure they can even point you in the right direction where there, there, there is access to SME finance. There is. Don't think it's impossible. Don't just walk to your banks. Go to World Bank. Go to all these institutions. Divid uh, through the British Embassy. So many others that can guide you towards uh, accessing um, uh, uh, money for market research also, for training, uh, for experience, as well as for financing. It might be a partnership. You have to put in a dollar. They put in a dollar. Something like that. There's so many opportunities for SMEs. So you have to go and do your research. So you have to find adequate financing, and you have to find the partner or the marketing trading partner. Thank you. Span the ranges of products under the same brand or diversify market by concentrating in formal markets. I personally have taken the avenue that you're better off dealing with the likes of Food Lovers Market, ShopRite, Pick and Pay, Choppies, Spa, Jumbo, all of these. Why? Because you've got a guaranteed market. Because if you sign up with these guys, A, you know they can take the volumes. B, they'll ensure you're compliant and you need to be compliant to run your business. And C, what's most important, that's important to your investor or your banker, if you are with a bank, is you need to know you've got guaranteed payment. These guys guarantee payment and they do not fail to pay you. And you know out there in the wholesale market how difficult that is to raise revenue. You will go under on debts if you just give your product to someone you don't know them and you don't know when they'll pay. But all these guys pay on the button, I promise you. They're international organizations. They cannot afford to get a bad name. So they'll take the product from you and they will pay you. And they'll pay you so regularly that you will be able to, to work your cash flow and all your payment structure based on their payments. And that's very important when you put your business plan through. So certainly that to me, and a superior milling model, and my national milling model has been very successful up to now, has been because I've concentrated my business model on the formal markets, on the supermarkets. So I'm able to continue to grow. ShopRite are putting up six more stores this year. Uh, Choppies are putting up between six and ten more stores this year. Food lovers, I'm sure there's new stores coming in. Game, there's new stores coming in. It's fantastic for the growth of the industry. They need your product, I promise you. Okay, just carry on. I know I've gone beyond my time. <laughs> Creating the competitive edge. Why do I say that? Because we have a saturation of all the products we've been mentioning, most of them. So you must stand out different to your next competitor. It's very, very important. You have to have something different. It can just be that your product is better, your packaging is better. Packaging is very, very important because the consumer is looking for a well-packaged product, something that stands out and hits them and can outdo any imported product. 
So your packaging is very, very important. Your finished product, your compliance, your, your, your health and safety, all, all these sort of factors, especially now we've got cholera and that, are all very important factors in how you have the competitive edge. Your location, your distribution. You know, these days you can sign up with a distributor. A lot of people are not aware of that. Make a point of that. I can tell you who you can list with. So your product is distributed and even listed with a supermarket by a distributor, Horizon. I'm just giving examples. So you might think, right, I can't meet the requirements of ShopRite because there are around 32 stores and it's all over the country and don't have the volume. But you could, you could sign up with a distributor who would take your product and he consolidates it and he has all the headache of dealing with the supermarkets. But obviously he's going to take a cut of your margin. Remember that. Okay, but these are opportunities and uh, areas that you have to have a competitive edge. Next slide. What are the successes? Next. Success number one, of course, diversification. I think it's very important. It's government's policy at the moment, value addition, diversification. Look at government policy. Look at areas where you can produce something different to what's been going on. I've given you some hints about cassava and uh, you know where there are opportunities in the market. So with us, I went for the mongo rice because I think that you, all of you, if I ask you to put your hands up now, and I will, this is my market research, how many of you eat or like mongo rice? Put your hands up now. There we are, you see, 60% of you. I think some of you are a bit shy. Do you see where it comes from? So it's, for me, it's about import substitution. You know, I've had so many foreign investors come through and we walk up and down the supermarkets and we just look at every single product on the shelf and we decide which can be produced here in this country. As the Honourable BS knows, we've done this on our ZAM week. Which can we replace from import to local, which will save the company a fortune in foreign exchange and taxes and duties and all these things and, and individual things, which are a problem with, with importing those products. Why can't we produce these things locally here? We can. We can. It's possible. So definitely, uh, you know, having that uh, diversification is very important. Mongo rice was our main diversification. Uh, says number two, uh, obviously, you know, for us, I needed to get to be the leading brand in the country, and uh, it's very important that I had to compete against my old company, and now statistics show in ShopRite, which is the main uh, outlet supermarkets in the country, they've got 32 stores, that uh, we're now the number one leading brand in the country, and I've pushed my old company to number two. I think that's a worth a round of applause, because that's not easy, they're big, they're multinational, and they're 100% owned by an American company. So they've got unlimited access to finance. And we are a local indigenous family company. Do you see what can be done? You know, it is possible. So definitely um, that's all come from, let's uh, see the next slide. Again, what have we done different? This is what we've done different. They didn't listen to me. Mr. Mellinger listened to me. We needed to do something slightly different. So what I did is to reach out to all of you through the media, through social media. You all have smartphones now. You know, tell me any other milling company that is in the media like we are. Who else has a radio show? Who else has TV shows? Who, who is interactive? If you go onto Facebook now and put in uh, Superior Milling, you'll immediately see everything we're doing. There's no other milling companies doing that in this country. Why are we doing it and why are they not? Because we've got nothing to hide. Because we're compliant. Because we want to interact with our customers. They maybe have got things to hide. Maybe. They don't want to interact with you. Why? <laughs> why don't they do it? <laughs> they don't do it. So you've got to ask yourself, who should you buy from? Simple as that, you see? So that's why you know, we really push ourselves on that. Other key thing we do, and we're very proud of it, corporate social responsibility. We give back to the community we work in. And it's not just something we talk about. I've been doing it for 15 years. And we've got a very active, active program for it. We just finished a six-week Give Back to Christmas, which was a partnership with Radio Christian Voice, where we gave back to an orphanage uh, once every six weeks leading up to Christmas to put some happy, smiling faces on those that don't have. And we're very proud of it. Very proud of it. Thank you. So we continue to that. Again, have you been doing that? Do you see? 
<laughs> that's our competitive edge, and we'll continue to do it as we grow. And Superior Milling have a massive expansion program. We brought in a new partner. I'm not at liberty to tell you who it is, but when you do finally get the public announcement, you'll see we have a very big expansion program where we want to get into the stock feed industry, into the wheat milling industry, and expand our mills around the country so we can continue to develop based on this model. So I think that's the last slide. Let me just check. I think maybe just uh, a, a very important. Let me just cover this. SMS entrepreneurs, should, sorry, just go back the slide. Because <laughs> it's very, very important we just uh, reiterate that. Sorry if I can just bear with me for one second. Next one. Right. SME entrepreneurs should conduct thorough market research before deciding on your business model and sign up those trading partnerships. Very important. SME entrepreneurs should ensure to access reliable and secure markets, preferably with a trade supply agreement, or commit to purchase your products. SME entrepreneurs should source working capital via equity partnerships or bank loans, but they should be, it should be towards uh, yeah, SME where there's favorable terms. That's why I say the one thing I left out here is you need to talk to some of the donors, who have facilities for SMEs so you can access that support you need. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry I went over the time. Thank you so very much. Uh, I think that was extremely informative and it's given a lot of perspective to the ins and outs of the challenges and opportunities that present themselves. As you know, this is supposed to be an interactive session, and so we're going to open up the mic for now to take a few questions from the audience. And what we'll ask is that, as the roving mic makes its way around the room, if you've got a question, kindly raise your hand, and someone will get the microphone to you. Um, introduce yourself and the organization that you represent, and if your question is specifically for one of the individuals that have spoken already, please do advise. We ask that we keep the questions brief, and uh, one question per person, please, so that we get through as many questions as we can before we go towards the end of this morning session. Uh, any takers? Uh, there's a hand from the gentleman. Should I stand or sit? Should I stand or sit? Uh, before, uh, sorry, I'll just disturb you for a moment. And fortunately, uh, as we well know, there is a lot that needs to be done with government institutions. And I'm reliably informed by a young lady who's whispered in my ear that the PS received a text message and she is required quite urgently at another meeting. And so um, we will ask that we bid a fond farewell, and P.S., thank you so very much for gracing this event this morning, and all the very best of the rest of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for our guest of honor as she takes leave. Thank you. Thank you very much. You may be seated, and the gentleman with the microphone will go first. I'm David Chisula, representing Zello Foods Limited. I thought I had the two important question. I don't know if I can answer. Very brief. Uh, well, let's stick with one. Uh, okay. So pick the more important one. They were all important. Okay. And it was for the two remaining. Uh, we, we must insist one question per person. Okay. Uh, you, can engage with, you can engage with the speakers after if there are additional questions. Okay. Although yes, sir. it was so important to the general public here. Okay. My question is to food lovers. When they present their presentation, they're quite, uh, quite enticing and very nice. But uh, when you go to the practical aspect of what they present, you want to start uh, supplying, you find you hit a brick wall. Even if you may meet all the standards, you may find to an extent where you feel like, do I need to give a golden handshake, which is not good? I don't know what you're taking. Um, okay, well, I'm not pretty sh so sure how to answer that question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you help me, but uh, I'll just give one remark. I, I've not heard of um, a farmer who has a produce, 
By the way, we don't deal with middlemen. We deal directly with producers. So that's our policy. I've not heard one uh, who has come and been turned down uh, for any apparent reason. But uh, Mr. Cotton, maybe you can pick it up as well. Thank you very much. Yes, I work very closely with all the supermarkets, particularly with Mr. Bota at uh, ShopRite, and we've had him on uh, media organizations, the radio and the TV, put him on the spot with this question, and said, how easy is it to access the market or not? And there is a criteria to follow. You know, particularly number one is that you have to have a registered business. I was very interested to hear that uh, under food lovers you can be a sole ownership, but again, it must be surely registered with PACRA because it has to be a business. So you have to be a business first. You have to go through PACRA, number one, okay? You need to be uh, compliant as far as, uh, you know, uh, health and safety regulations are concerned. So particularly at the moment with cholera and everything else, so you have to make sure that your, your handling facilities are inspected, your packaging is approved. So again, my advice is there, you go through SABs, SABs we work with, ZABs work with, with our off-taker as well. So if you go through ZABs, they will advise you how to be compliant in order to meet the standards of the supermarkets. So, you know, ShopRite and Pick and Pay both have their own packing stations. So they actually take your produce and then they pack it. I'm talking about vegetables now. They pack it and they put it on the shelves. And pick and pay do the same. You're probably not aware of that, which is why they deal with very small farmers and you don't have to be committed to a supply, whereas the bigger farmers, it tends to be based on volume. So you definitely, and I'm not sure how food lovers work on vegetables, but more than likely that you buy ad hoc. You, there, you buy ad hoc. So it, it really gives you an opportunity to access this market. So unless you can specifically tell me what the problem has been as far as the obstacles, if you can specifically tell, tell me and we can take your details, we can get back to you because definitely it's media's put out a, portrayed a bad picture of the supermarkets. They are supporting local enterprise, I promise you. Uh, thank you. There's a gentleman who had raised his hand. Um, his hand's up now. If there are any other people who'd like to ask questions, the gentleman at the back as well. I see your hand. Thank you. Um, my name is Jones uh, Mulunga, Honorable. I'm practicing integrated farming from Mumbwa. Now, this is a very good program, but then I have a question. Uh, followed by an observation. Uh, when I went through the brochure, uh, the beneficiary criteria is that the program is going to target emerging and poor farmers. And then there is a, a gross annual revenue of 150,000 that a poor farmer is supposed to meet. So I don't understand the definition of a poor farmer who's going to manage to get the 150 gross. <coughs> now, the, the observation is that when it comes to the practicality of it, uh, when we talk about value addition, what crops are we talking about here? I think the program, in terms of the, the applications that you receive to the boot camp, I really want to learn from those applications and see how many of those emerging and young farmers are practically adding value to tomato, cabbage, onion, uh, eggs, and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that, and maybe Lukonga can add on afterwards. But um, I think there's a bit of confusion. Uh, component one uh, of the project deals with two different types of uh, stakeholders or beneficiaries. Um, the farmers are benefiting from component 1A, which is the productive alliances of Zambia. And component uh, 1B deals with SMEs. We are here dealing with SMEs, not with farmers. So the figures that you're giving, the targets or thresholds you're giving, are for SMEs and not for farmers. Oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lom Tunzijere. I'm the agribusiness specialist on the project. And uh, if you would like to, 
Um, I don't know how much time we have, but if you'd like to, you could pass through our office and then we can have a discussion on that. But basically we are here to talk about component 1B, SMEs benefiting um, um, from the boot camp and eventually benefiting from the project under Market Connect. Um, what you're talking about is productive alliances in Zambia that will work with farmers and farmer groups. And yes, we will have thresholds there and we'll have suitable thresholds for farmers. My name is Chisulo from Ramasses. We are into maize uh, growing. I want to find out why you arrived at uh, having a few number of SMEs in your boot camp. And I don't know how that relates to the government agenda for industrialization. I would wish that uh, we extended and probably in agreement with Honorable Mulonga from Mumbwa to have something for those that are just starting who may not be able to make the 150,000 that you, you guys make every month, every year. Thank you. Okay. Any takers? Um. Good day, my name is Munza Miangana. I'm, uh, I work with Bongo Hive. I think uh, what was stated throughout this uh, with, uh, with uh, two previous speakers is that the boot, the boot camp is really a precursor to uh, the Zambia agribusiness agri and uh, trade project. Oh, which apologies. Oh, great. So, what I said was that um, the agri boot camp that is uh, coming up is actually runs until, if you notice the one of the slides that my colleague Lukonga put up, it runs until around uh, April, May, and it's a precursor to the Zambia Agriculture and Trade Project, which then kicks off soon after that, which is a, a longer term project, like uh, if you heard uh, Lomantunzi from uh, government speak about, was that it's a more longer term project with components that actually deal with the, with, with, with the specific sectors that you're actually looking about, uh, talking about. So farmers are being catered for in the long term project, and small and a larger component of small businesses will be catered for in the long-term project. So this precursor is really just to kick it off and to prepare people for the long-term project that are, that are going to take part. So nobody has been forgotten about. Uh, it's just that we do need to deal with the specific business types and to, to ensure that, for example, where we're doing very well with regards to production, any economy that has to grow needs complexity in its production to start to take place, and that is what we start to address with, with the other component which leads, which kicks off with the boot camp. So it's a precursor, and that's why it's only called a boot camp. Thank you very much. Ah. And we're requesting that please um, provide your email addresses if you haven't. We'll be able to send you information for those that do want it. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Cotton. My name is Miriam. Um, and my name is uh, called Mimright. Um, my question goes to Mr. Cotton. As you talk about uh, rice in uh, Western province, are you looking at uh, the variety of rice that uh, you want to produce in Mongo? Because my concern is the, the variety, the kind of variety that you are introducing in Mongo. There's a lot of rice in Luapula, but the quality, the variety, the kind of variety that they grow in Luapula. Kaputa, we talk of Kaputa, there's a lot of rice. The maroon rice, the original, original rice, it's in Luapula. Kaputa. But you find that the quality the variety, the kind of variety that people are given in those areas, it's a very, very poor quality. That's why people go for Nakonde rice and they settle for that variety because it is a very good variety. They supply the hotels and all those are, are good places because they know that when they serve on the plate, the flavor, the fragrance will come out nicely. But the kaputa rice is just there. 
also we really want to talk about the kind of variety that you are going to introduce in Mongo. We don't want the, quant the quantities. Another thing is the potatoes that we have in this country. It's a very, very poor quality compared to the potatoes that, has, that are in South Africa and uh, uh, Nakonde, even Nakonde, they've got a good variety. Mr. Biabamba produces a lot of potatoes, but the quality is very poor. Sorry to say this. So we really need to work about the quality, the variety, the kind of variety that we introduce in this country. We don't want substandard things. Because a lot of rice will be grown in Mongo, but the quality. People complain about the starch content in that rice. Mongo rice. They don't like the starch. And uh, that rice is, sometimes you find it takes long to sell. And you bring rice from Nakonde and people just get it, uh, you know? So that's my concern, Mr. Cotton. Excellent market research there, you see? <laughs> Free of charge. <laughs> well done. Very good question. Thank you. We've started with Mongo rice because we're very active in Western Province. We've got six depots in Western Province, so it made sense. And uh, the Royal Establishment approached us and uh, we, the government, and we, we really worked out a very good model. But what came about this year is we were receiving different varieties, and that was upsetting our, our quality. So we've embarked on only the super rice, Super rice is the number one. It's that uh, Malawi fire rice, which is like the Malawi rice. And a lot of people do like it, I promise you. Okay, so we started there. But being that through our expansion program, we're going to be even more national, I'm not limiting myself to just mongo rice. Otherwise, we'd be tribalistic, wouldn't we? We'd only be Western provinces. And I'm very aware of Kaputa rice. I'm very aware of Nakondi rice and all these different rices. I've been approached by different farmers. So what we will do is approach the likes of our trading partners, and we will list different rices as we go on, because that way I can expand the volumes and expand the sales of different types of rice and brand it Kaputa rice, brand it Nakondi rice, brand it this or that rice. Do you see? Chama rice as well. So definitely that's the way we'll go. So thank you very much. But it'll take us a year to roll it out. Thank you. Oh, sorry, potatoes. The seed producers have a very important role to play here. Even on the rice, there's been a lot of research done about rice varieties, but it's more for commercial. So it's more to do with the market, which is why you're right. But when it comes to seed potatoes, you get it from the seed manufacturers. They shouldn't necessarily be using their own, just the same as with maize. So I think that information needs to get back. I can help do that as well. So that they look at the, the seed varieties of potatoes so to, to produce better quality. I agree with you. I tend to buy the imported potatoes before the local ones. For that reason, they make better chips, don't they? <laughs> we'll have our last two questions, um, but as stated earlier, there will be an opportunity to interact with all of our speakers. Uh, the lady with the microphone and the lady with a hand up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Lydia Chwambo. I'm coming from Zambia Agro Biodiversity Alliance. My question is on the, the finalist for the booth camp in terms of what prices are there. I think it hasn't been uh, given. Like, is it uh, going to be a standardized kind of price in each province or it would depend on the business? Thank you. Um, who wants to take that? Yvonne? Uh, my name is Yvonne Mtumbi uh, from AgriPro Focus. Uh, in terms of prices, we've got different partners on board um, that are offering, for instance, Food Lovers is keen on providing shelf um, space. So it would depend also on the kind of uh, business that one is undertaking. But um, related to that, there are also partners that have come on board to give uh, universal prizes. Yeah, I hope that's... Hello, good morning. My name is Esther. I'm a cassava farmer, and my question goes to Mr. Peter Curtin. 
Um, I wanted to find out for a person like me who cannot afford to buy the machinery to add value to the cassava, how do you help me to add value to it? Because I believe that in cassava there's glue made, made out of it, there's books, there's confectionery and flour also. So I wanted to find out how you're going to help cassava farmers to add value to it. It's a very good question because um, if we just get it as a raw product, we've got to put in the initial processing. As you know, there's the de-skinning, there's the aflatoxin levels, there's all those problems with cassava. We would prefer to empower you with small little uh, mills and processes that bring it to us as flour. Because then all I have to do is have a mixing machine in my mill to add the flour. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity for you. You can Google this. There's a lot of cheap Chinese and Indian mills which you can access to go into the, to the pre-processing of cassava and then we would buy it from you as cassava flour. And these are not big machines. You know, like a rice mill, $10,000, which is what, 100,000 kwacha. You know, you can access that capital financing. Uh, you can get into this, this small milling process so that you can have a trading partner with us because definitely the minister's pushing us to get into this cassava mix. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we've received quite a bit of information in that Q&A session. As was stated, uh, those were our last two questions. If there are any further questions, please feel free to engage with any of our panelists at a later stage. Um, sorry, ma'am, uh, those are the last two, but please feel free to chat with them at a later stage. At this time, I'd like to call our moderator, who will be running through quite an exciting session, and he will help us by introducing our panelists. And our moderator for this Spark Talk panel is none other than Lukonga Lindunda. Uh, I believe there's another mic that's uh, out there. Good. Uh, I'll invite to the stage Maria uh, Zalumis. Are you here? Ah, you're here. Okay, good. Just oh, please come. And <laughs> Mutaba Good. You can just take a seat there. Mutaba. Uh, okay, good. Uh, we'll have a nice conversation for about 15 minutes. Uh, these are amazing um, people. Maria, some of you may know her, uh, touted as the sort of youngest commercial farmer in Zambia, and uh, Mutaba Ngoma here, who is uh, in 2017 was uh, one of the top 30 most promising young business people in Africa? Yes, good. Um, so, some of the, in fact, the last question that was asked around how can you get into processing um, something that you produce, um, I'll start with uh, uh, Mutoba because he has a nice story about how uh, he processes lots of things. Uh, so if you can please introduce yourself, talk about your business, um, how you started your business. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mutoba Ngoma. I run a. Sounds weird. Hello. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I run a business called Tapera Industries Limited. Uh, it's uh, basically a business that focuses on uh, renewable, renewable energy and hygiene uh, by producing uh, uh, natural soap products from uh, vegetable oils. Some of you know, know it as chinkonja, which you see around the markets and all over the place. Uh, so our main focus uh, since we has been um, processing uh, vegetable oils uh, from uh, various oil seeds including sunflower, uh, cotton oil as well as jatropha. And uh, with the sunflower of course we make the animal feed as well as uh, cooking oil. But uh, our larger focus was on the biofuel side of things. So that's, that's how we came into the Jatropha processing. Uh, I started this about 10 years ago um, as a way to basically participate in uh, energy, uh, energy security for the country because of uh, biodiesel production. Uh, but uh, over the years, we had to di diversify our business uh, in line with what we were already doing by uh, adding, uh, by adding the uh, product of uh, the chinkonja, the soap, because it was easier to produce and it kept uh, our business 
basically feasible or viable. Um, should I go through the... No, no, no. Oh. Okay, we don't have time to do that. <laughs> Maria, if you can talk a bit about how you started and, and how long it's taken you to get to where you are now. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm the CEO of Chizini Farms. My voice is not good, I've got a flu. <laughs> Um, we start. We've started. We started off. I've, I actually started about a year and a half ago. Uh, we grow tomato on a large scale, but uh, we're also into cattle ranching and seedlings now. So we've diversified a little bit, um, just to keep the business feasible, like he said. Um, Tuzini has three partners, uh, my mom and me and my sister, but I am the one who runs everything. Um, we've grown, I think, very rapidly over the last year and a half, uh, funded by us. No one has funded us, unfortunately. Um, but, um, yeah, that's uh, anything else you want me to talk about, Lukonga? I've just come out of my field, so I'm a bit sun-baked and confused. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, yeah. is, is there one thing that you can point yeah. out and say this is what really made the big difference for me in starting and yeah. also growing my business? Yeah. Uh, I had a lot of support uh, from the chemical companies like MRI Seed, uh, AgriFocus, uh, Omnia Fertilizers, so lots of input into education. As you know that I'm not a, an agriculturalist, I've never been to school on agriculture, I'm a nurse by profession. So um, that really helped me grow. I also think a lot of accounting also went into it, a lot of financial discipline uh, went into, into the business and um, I'm actually diversifying a little bit away from tomato. I'm going into onion production. We are breaking our fields at the moment, uh, going into onion. We'll still do tomato, but um, on Tuzini 3, because there's Tuzini 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, um, Mutawa, if you can just uh, also talk a bit about that one thing that you think made a big difference for you and your business. Yeah. Um, okay, for me, basically, uh, let's see, because what inspired me like, uh, to really set out on this journey was um, a program that I watched on uh, TV. Uh, about Brazil and how they do their biofuels since 1970s, which made them energy independent. And then one day I saw this guy on TV making diesel in his garage for his own use and running his car. And his equipment was so basic. And so I thought, well, instead of me going to import something from somewhere, maybe let's try and make something at UNSA, at TDIU. And so I talked to the engineers there and we worked on something. And so what I found that the one thing that kept driving me was just the focus of getting it done. Because like I was not waiting for, for some funds from somewhere. I just needed to start as small as possible and scale up eventually. So that's why I thought that maybe just going out there and just starting it was the way forward for me. Yeah. So, so that's one of the myths. Everyone tries to understand how do you actually get funded. So I, I needed to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, borrow money from the bank? Did, who, who gave you money? Where did you get that money from? <laughs> Just for the benefit of everyone, I think you've been so successful, but everyone needs to understand how you actually got to where you are now. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for me, um, I got a small loan from my dad. Uh, just to get some things fabricated here and there. It wasn't a lot of money, but just... How much? <laughs> um, let me say a thousand kwacha, you know. So um, that was enough for me to buy some second-hand drums and get enough uh, raw materials to start the whole process. And basically for me, the biggest uh, thing I was trying to also look at was I needed proof of concept. Despite it being shown around the world that it's possible, I needed to see for myself that it was possible. And so I had to start as small as possible and, yeah. So it doesn't take a lot to start, yeah. Maria? Um, to start Tuzini, we actually started on half a hectare, 10,000 plants, and I saved for four years. <laughs> I saved $30,000 that I started off with. 
And then I got a loan from my mom, uh, and she gave me only 5,000 kwacha. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I started. Okay, this, this, this is a good story. I also want people to understand where you are now. So talk a bit about, if, you, if you're you know, generous enough, talk about how much you make. But t tell us the size of your businesses, how many people you're employing now, um, things like that, yeah. Okay, uh, right now we have 62 employees. 34 of those are women. I love women. <laughs> um, we have about nine hectares of tomato. I'm going to 10. I have about 40 cattle only. I'm, I'm looking to increase my herd. So if anyone is selling a bull, please let me know. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we grew our business just from, you know, the proceeds that came from half the, half the hectare, I reinvested them back into the business and we kept on reinvesting and I live very, very tight. So that's, that's, that's the way I do it, and my accountant's always whipping me, because, yeah. But the fluctuation in price affects us a lot, hmm. yeah. And of course the cholera situation didn't help yeah, us. Yeah, and the market now is on my head, on yeah. our head, is that an FU? <laughs> Indeed, I'm <laughs> um, Question again, um, right now, where are you? Where How are many people do you employ? How much do you make, if you want to say that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that is armed. <laughs> um, so basically, where we are at now, um, let's see, we've actually been growing from strength to strength since uh, 2014, uh, because in 2014 is when we partnered with uh, Musica Agricultural Initiatives and the United States Africa Development Foundation around the Jatrofa project. Uh, we are working in uh, Eastern Province. Uh, we, when we started in 2014, we had uh, about 50 small-scale farmers growing, uh, growing uh, the Jatrofa for us. Now we've, we've grown up to 1,800 farmers. And uh, it's also scaled up our production, our processing from uh, 10 tons per month to 50 tons per month. And uh, recently we signed a contract to export our, the bulk of our produce to South Africa. So we are hoping that this will be a good year for us. And uh, right now we, we basically work with seasonal staff a lot because we have only 10 permanent employees. Then about 30 seasonal because uh, we, we mostly work with them on the harvest time. Then when, it's no, when there's no harvest, we... We, we put them on hold. So, yeah, um, our income is generous and yeah, <laughs> we are comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just as, as a next step now, as we end the conversation, um, what's next for, for you? Uh, any ambition of getting to, uh, of adding more value to whatever you produce? Uh, and just a bit of advice to everyone uh, in the room, uh, what they should do next as, as regards the boot camp. Yeah. Um, yes, we're looking at uh, value adding. Uh, I'm thinking of tomato processing uh, at the moment, so that's something that I'm thinking of. Um, advice to everyone who wants to get into farming. Uh, it's, it's very important to get advice from people who are in your business. Uh, get mentors. I've got three. And uh, yeah, just start small, be financially disciplined, and go for it. As for the boot camp, please don't miss it. Attend it. It's very important for your education, for your knowledge. I'm learning every day. I learn every day. I learn on the internet. I learn from lots of people in the industry. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, closing remarks. Next uh, steps for uh, next steps. the panel. Yeah, yeah so... Um, Let's see, um, right now the whole world is going green, uh, environmentally conscious, and we hope to be a key participa uh, partici participant in the whole industry. And uh, that's what we're just working towards, increasing our, um, our um, raw material base and maybe establishing more elaborate markets in the mines and maybe with superior milling. And uh, hopefully, uh, things will just take off and become better. And uh, like my colleague said, uh, 
the best the best way to do your business is talk to people who have done it before because a lot of times there's a lot of people going to give you advice based on their opinion of what they think should be done but they haven't actually done it so you will find you you make a lot of mistakes based on other people's opinions so talk to people who've done it seek advice and grow from there and as for the boot camp um I think this is the best platform to learn from because there's so many experts who are participating in it and they've got the advice that you need to get from where you are right now to where you want to be. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for paying attention to this session, but these guys may be around uh, to, to interact with you, um, but please get a hold of their details. They're available on Facebook and all those places. Thank you so much. A hand uh, for them. Thank you so very much. Extremely inspiring stories about getting up and actually just doing it. And that's the whole essence of our speakers. They got up and they tried something. Uh, they took the risks in stride. And they're success stories that we can look to today. And that could be any, any one of us in this room from here on in. All good things sadly must come to an end. And so I'm going to call upon someone who will be giving us our closing remarks for this really, really exciting launch that has happened. Uh, it's got me fired up and excited about the prospects of the future with regards to agribusiness. Uh, our speaker is coming through from the World Bank and specifically the private sector uh, finance, competitiveness and innovation. And she's a senior private sector specialist. And her name is... Ellen Olofsson, please welcome her to the lecture. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, I held my remarks off to the end. I just arrived in Lusaka. I visited a few times and I was very inspired by the country. Uh, I was working with the Ministry for Industry and Trade to help prepare the Agribusiness and Trade Project. And at the end of it, I had the, uh, the World Bank offered me the opportunity to actually move here. So this week I arrived with my daughter um, and we are waiting for school to start. Uh, but I'm also very excited for this to be my very first opportunity upon arrival. Uh, to engage with you uh, on a topic that's very important um, in, in my mind. And I hope that this can be the first um, chance for me to, to meet you and we will have many other interactions as this program rolls out. I'll be here for the next uh, couple of years. Um, I wanted to also thank everybody, uh, all the speakers, the permanent secretary had to leave us. Um, but I think as you, um, you heard, it's a priority for the government uh, to provide an enabling environment for agribusiness. So what we're trying to do through this project uh, is to work with private sector to ensure that you get the contacts, you get the know-how of what there is market opportunity for and how you, how you tap into it but then also work with government to give them feedback and say, listen, here are the things that are not working so well when companies go, maybe they go to the standards agency and it takes too long, or the standards agency doesn't have time, or maybe they go um, to register to get a license, uh, and it's complicated. So we will be using this boot camp and other programs where we're working with the SMEs to also get feedback that the government will then, will then act on. But this permanent secretary, I have to tell you, I've worked in probably about 70 different countries. This permanent secretary, she wants to make a change. So when she says she wants to create an enabling environment for private sector, she really means it. It's not often in my work that I meet permanent secretaries like her. So I want you to know that. Um, it was also what inspired me to come here because I knew I had somebody who was actually serious about, I think you said, just do it, right? Um, I wanted to, uh, to say, to, for food lovers, thank you very much for coming. 
And I think one big takeaway from, from what you said was we need your product. No? So Food Lovers is expanding, other supermarkets are expanding, there are markets, there are conditions to access those markets, but that's the way the, the world works. Huh? Um, to to uh, Peter Cotton as well from Superior Milling, thank you so much. Um, I think the message that you put through strong and hard, the market first, look for where the market opportunity is, that's where you start. Um, you also offered some good guidance on financing. I think many times when I meet um, owners of SMEs, the very first thing in the mind is finance. And the very first focus is often the bank. And I think you offered some other ways of thinking about it. And the entrepreneurs that we just had up here as well, talking about that their first part of call was not debt financing, it was not the banks. They found other ways of, of accessing and starting. I also think our entrepreneur showed us something very important. Actually, I heard Mr. Potter um, whisper it, determination. And we talk a lot about in the run-up to the boot camp that we're looking for growth-oriented entrepreneurs. How do you define that? What defines a growth-oriented entrepreneur? Someone with passion, yeah, someone with passion, someone with determination, someone whose personal slogan is just do it, just get out there, just start something. Um, and then seek other people who can feel, be honest with yourself, right? Be honest with yourself about what you know and what you don't know. When you don't know, you ask, right? Um, and that's what the boot camp is, is set up to do, is to have those conversations about here's where you see opportunity. And then you speak with people who are in the industry to say, okay, let's look at that opportunity in more detail. What, where, how do you know that is a feasible opportunity? How do you know that you're prepared to get to, to do what needs to be done to actually take advantage of the opportunity? What do you need to do? What are those steps? What are the different ways that you need to manage your finances? Should you look for external finance or should you look internally to generate your own cash flow to be able to, exp uh, to expand? So, um, I don't think I'm going to say anything more than that at the moment, uh, but I also wanted to, um, at the very end, also thank uh, AgriPro Focus and Bongo Hive, um, Lukonga, Simunsa, Yvonne, um, everybody in the Bongo Hive and AgriPro Focus team. Um, I was a bit of a tough customer. Um, but, so I also have some standards, just like the supermarkets. Um, but I hope you've all enjoyed this session, and please do stay in touch. Huh? Can, maybe can everyone from Bongo Hive and AgriPro Focus just stand up so people know who to talk to about the applications? Okay. All right, so now you know who to tap and who to ask. Maybe, uh, Lukonga, do you want to say something at the, at the very end? Are you good? <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, someone wanted to clap. <laughs> you can contact us on WhatsApp as well, um, but please keep the messages short. Um, you can also call um, the contact details. George couldn't put up the contact details there. So, we are available to help you um, understand the criteria, fill in the forms. And if there's any feedback that you need, please, you can get in touch with us on all the possible platforms available. Uh, all the best. Uh, we'll meet some of you in Chipata, Kitwe. Please let your friends and business partners know that this opportunity is there for them and for you as well. So have a nice uh, afternoon and stay away from cholera. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just to harp a bit more on the issue of living in a time of cholera, a dispenser for hand sanitizer has been mounted on the wall as we exit. Please uh, make use of that. Remember to Bluetooth your greetings to each other and go wireless, uh, contact free, and enjoy what's left of the day. 
Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege being your master of ceremony. My name is Kamiza Chikula. I hope and trust that we'll meet again. But if we do not see each other on God's good earth, I hope we'll see you in heaven. God bless you.